Hey, I want to take a few minutes to react to Beth Allison Barr's 2021 book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth, so she says. Now, the author's first seven words in the main text are, I never meant to be an activist. So scholar testimonials on the back cover say that uh, this is a, you know, you can't put it down. It's an absolutely a game changer book. Uh, sorry to say, though, that um, this is really rather a poor outing. It's not really that useful of a book, but let's look at it anyway. Many Christians believe that men and women were created in God's image, equal in value before him, uh, but different, harmoniously designed each to complement the other. We call this often complementarianism. But Barr is pushing back against this viewpoint and the viewpoint of this book, 1991, uh, John Piper, Wayne Grudem, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. This is a remarkable book. If you want, uh, look in the end notes here. You'll see a couple of quotations of what they say uh, biblical femininity and bi biblical masculinity is. So Barr's mission is to untell the complementarian viewpoint. Barr sees biblical womanhood as the idea that, quote, women were made to desire their husbands and let them rule, and that God designed women primarily to be submissive wives, virtuous mothers, and joyful homemakers. That's a proposal that uh, it appears she finds objectionable. But Barr insists that we've misinterpreted the Bible. Those who embrace complementarian understanding, she says, do so because Christian history has been misrepresented. It's been rewritten. So her, she has an attempt here now to re-educate us, and this isn't anything new. This is uh, very standard stuff. People are always trying to get you re-educated about what the past was like and what the facts really are. So we want to go back to the Bible for our facts. But if, if we want to know, she's going to try to help us. Uh, why? Because she says this. Because women's leadership has been forgotten. Because women's stories throughout history have been covered up, neglected, or retold to recast women as less significant than they really are. Unquote. Now, if that sounds like boilerplate feminist theology, it's because it is. Barr wants us to stop neglecting the history of female Christian leadership. How would she have us uh, stop neglecting it? Well, for example, she wants us to embrace the idea that at least one woman was ordained a bishop. She's got some pages where she talks about that. Barr tells different stories. One story is about a lady named Margaret. She says, quote, a woman who defied marriage, defied male authority, fought and killed a dragon and was anointed by God the same way that Jesus was anointed, unquote. Well, that's kind of interesting stuff in there. But um, by the way, when you do an anointing, I've always anointed starting at the head, not the feet. Uh, it seems like biblically the anointings happen at the head. But let's just keep moving here. Now, on the basis of these and other stories, Barr says that the women remembered by medieval Christianity undermine the modern biblical womanhood. That is, she's trying to say that it undermines this uh, false teaching, supposedly, that uh, that these guys teach. Instead of the clear teaching of Bible passages, Barr prefers that we would frame our understanding of women in Bible history or women in the history of the church. Basically, to take these uh, maybes and tall tales as our measure. Remember this woman that slew the dragon and all that? Uh, but are we really even really surprised? Because she did warn us she was an activist. You know, she admits she desires to, quote, flip the Christian narrative about patriarchy. So, again, not really any big surprises here. Now, the medieval period her, is her area of expertise, and she actually had an opportunity to, to make a contribution here uh, with her book. She could have given us some useful, substantive contribution, but she didn't really do it. Now, I'm looking at Barr's book uh, because... Uh, this has begun to be passed around by uh, some people in my church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, we have a small number of people uh, in the church that have been wanting to bring on a women's ordination of the gospel ministry. They've tried it many times. They're very loud. It's been brought to three world church general conference sessions. Thousands of delegates from hundreds of countries have voted about this three times. And the an vote answer, in case you want to know, was no the first time, no the second time, and no the third time. But they keep at it, and uh, they probably will continue to keep at it. So this hasn't been approved, but they're, uh, they're pushing this. Now, we know that many other groups that have uh, gone for women's ordination have committed denominational suicide when their theologians and administrators became enamored of these ideas that led them to adopt women's ordination. And so Adventists favoring women's ordination have recently been passing this book around. Now, if you do read the book, you'll be harangued about oppression. There's many references about her great concerns about oppression everywhere. Uh, there's many concerns, dozens, about hierarchy. She talks about, oh no, the danger of hierarchy. And then uh, more pages than not out of this 250 page book, more pages than not, uh, patriarchy is, is mentioned again and again and again and again and again. I guess she thinks that she just mentions it enough times we will uh, sort of melt down and have a problem. And what's also interesting is that this author asserts the existence of intricate systems of racism and oppression. And she says that, quote, the roots of biblical womanhood extend from white supremacy, unquote. Sounds 
Sounds like the stuff that's passing around the last year or two in other areas. Now, Barr's convinced. She says that complementarianism is patriarchy and patriarchy is about power. Neither has ever been about Jesus, unquote. So according to Barr, complementarians are engaged in what she claims is a blind pursuit to maintain control over women, unquote. But it's difficult to know how her mind reading uh, viewpoint here, where she reads our minds and tells us our motives, these awful motives we have, how does that really help us come to clarity about Bible facts? Now, words in order here concerning Barr's hermeneutical approach. Hermeneutics, you know, are the, in effect, the rules of biblical interpretations, how we interpret the Bible in a way that makes sense to the Bible itself. So the reason people hold to a complementarian position, says Barr, is that their view is, quote, based on a handful of verses read apart from their historical context, unquote. She says, quote, cultural assumptions and practices regarding womanhood are read into the biblical text, unquote. So that's a charge of eisegesis, reading into the text things that aren't there. Uh, and she's got those kind of charges. Those are all very common charges. We've heard all those things again and again over and over. Rather than defending a plain and natural reading of the Bible, says Barr, complementarians are really defending an interpretation that has been corrupted by our sinful human drive to dominate others and to build hierarchies of power and oppression. So there we are back at the oppression, oppression, oppression worry again. Barr says that patriarchy exists in the Bible because the Bible was written in a patriarchal world. Historically speaking, there's nothing surprising about biblical stories and passages, here's her words again, riddled with patriarchal attitudes and actions. So our Bible, I guess, is, is riddled, riddled uh, through and through with patriarchal uh, problems here. She cautions against literalist or hierarchicalist hermeneutics. She says that in the Bible, the patriarchy is certainly there. It certainly exists in the Bible narrative, and it's, she says, on parade throughout the New Testament. From the exclusive leadership of male Jews to the harsh adultery laws applied to women and even to the writings of Paul, unquote. So Barr claims that echoes of Livy ended up in the New Testament. Paul's words are drawing from his Roman context. Now, you might remember, you might have heard of Livy. Livy is how many people referred to Titus Livius. He was a noted Roman historian. He died about 12 AD. Now, nobody denies that Paul existed in a particular cultural place and time. Of course not. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that the Bible transcends its cultural backgrounds to serve as God's word for all cultural, racial, and situational contexts in all ages, unquote. And many Adventists look at the Bible very differently than either Barr or most pro-women's ordination advocates in the church do. Now, I know that Barr is not an Adventist. Her writing indicates she's got a very different approach to biblical authority than we do. And let's face it, when she quotes scholars like Ben Wetherington, Phyllis Tribble, Bart Ehrman, Ed Stetzer, she's definitely placing herself in the not plain reading ca interpreter category. Now, some will be interested in Barr's view of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation, says Barr, meant that the arrival of renewed patriarchalism. So instead of a good thing, the Reformation brought a terrible day, this awful version of patriarchalism that she says was there. Biblical womanhood, she complains, quote, is rooted in human patriarchal structures that keep seeping back into the church, unquote. I wonder if it keeps seeping back into the church because it's in the Bible from the book of Genesis on a proper understanding of male and female and of patriarchy, not this super negative one that's everybody's passing around. Protestant reformer, she says, mapped scripture onto a preceding secular structure. So for Barr, the Reformation was hijacked to teach error. Now, some might be interested in what Seventh-day Adventist Ellen White writes concerning the patriarchal system in her book, Patriarchs and Prophets. Here's what Ellen White says. In early times, the father was the ruler and priest of his own family, and he exercised authority over his children even after they had families of their own. His descendants were taught to look up to him as their head in both religious and secular matters. This patriarchal system of government Abraham endeavored to perpetuate as it tended to preserve the knowledge of God. It was necessary to bind the members of the household together in order to build up a barrier against the idolatry that had become so widespread and so deep-seated, unquote. So that's Ellen White's view, a very prominent Adventist writer and more. Now, Barr includes some Bible arguments. It's true. She, for example, has some arguments here from Genesis chapter 2. And so one of her arguments is about a translation of the Hebrew word Isha. In Genesis 2, verses 22 to 24, English Bible translators, she says, read their history into the Hebrew text because in these verses, the rib is made up into a woman, Isha. And in verse 24, the same word is translated Isha, is translated woman, is translated wife. So you're translating it one time as woman and the other time you're translated as wife. So Barr complains that, quote, neither the word marriage nor the word wife even appears in the Hebrew text. While Barr fails to see that the word is the same because there is no different word for woman or wife in the Hebrew lexicon. This word relies on context for more specificity. And that's exactly what the reader gets in Genesis 2, 24. So in verse 24, we read that the man 
leaves his father and mother. That's a verb. That's a big change. He's leaving father and mother. He's joined to, glued to, joined to this woman. Uh, it's also, she's said to be his woman, and they're joined to become one flesh. And so that's the marriage. And so the te- context is very clear, very clear. There's a change of this. By the way, if you go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus refers back to this, and Jesus is good with it being the same way. So if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, but I, I'm not quite sure it's good enough for Beth Barr. But anyway, she complains that uh, the polygamous social universe of the Hebrew Bible was rendered in terms of a monogamous English marital discourse, unquote. So she had some different idea, I guess, going on about what's going on there. But uh, she's worried about these early English Bible translations. She says they did not accurately reflect Hebrew words or relationship, but instead they reflected just modern English sensibilities. We read all that business about marriage into the text. It wasn't there. Well, her conclusion is, is simply wrong. The translation of woman and then wife is accurate from its from its very first dis, uh, descriptions. The Bible tells us what the right viewpoint of men and women and sex and gender and marriage and all those things is about. And so God is telling us his plan. It transcends all cultural bubbles, even the one that Beth Barr is in. Now, to kind of come to her highlighted argument, she her culminates her book culminates in this charge that complementarians teach a heretical theology, a heresy. She charges that when complementarians teach that the son is subordinate to his father, that they're teaching Arianism, an ancient heresy. So Ball presents Amy Bird, who claims to read from a 2001 Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood document, which she claims stated that Jesus was subordinate to the father, not only in economy, but in essence. So that would mean Jesus is of a lesser essence. Now, she may accurately be representing some document, which I couldn't locate, although I tried, but I did discover another 2001 Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood document on their current website, which states unambiguously that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are of the same essence, which they, of course, are. That exactly directly contradicts the claim in this book. I don't think they ever taught that. I think this is uh, something twisty. By the way, it's kind of twisty that uh, Beth Barr quotes Amy Bird about this. Why doesn't Beth Barr quote it herself directly from the pages of the book? Or is it that Amy's words are more useful? Um, anyway, I can't go further with that because I don't have that, but very weird, very suspicious, and not necessarily inspiring a lot of confidence in this book. Now, it's certainly true that the father and son are of the same essence for eternity. But the son chooses voluntarily to submit to the father. And there's nothing heretical about voluntary submission to the father, uh, except, I guess, that it runs counter to Barr's underlying idea that basically all hierarchy somehow equals oppression. So Barr and others, they soldier on. It doesn't really matter how unhinged or hairs on fire sounding their arguments are. I think these are people that have been ideologically captured. I can at least agree with Beth Barr and at least uh, one thing she writes here. She says, many people, in order to make room for an egalitarian position, have to do something with the way we read scripture. So in other words, it's hermeneutics. And that's true. I think they do. I think they have to diminish the uh, reading of the Bible. Now, we agree that all men and women possess the same natural rights to life, to property, to right living, so long as it's not at the expense of others. But when egalitarianism means equal authority, equal roles, sameness, total interchangeability, when that's what it means, suddenly you need an arbiter to tell us what's equal, what's not, what's fair, what's not. And Christians become entangled in this energy sapping power relation conflicts just as Satan would have it. So, uh, yuck, what a mess. Well, anyway, let's summarize here. Barr's book, uh, I'd like to be friendly to it, but I have to say this book is underwhelming, even though it has a 2021 published date. Uh, So there's been chatter about the book. But you know what? Women's ordination, it's old news in most denominations. Virtually all the uh, denominations which have accepted women's ordination before, they've continued down the same theological track. It's not like we don't know where it lands and where it goes. And they all seem to land in these positions of Uh, concerning maleness and femaleness and sex and gender that are totally out of this world, off the Bible pages, out of of, uh, harmony with God. So don't think we really want to go there. And what's very interesting to me, I'll say this lastly, Barr's book, although it's it's surely well-intended by its author, the lack of evidence that it provides in favor of the positions that it gives us really reaffirms the, the point that there's really a sad lack of Bible and historical evidence favoring uh, basically her thesis. So how long will arguments like Barr's continue to be made? I guess about as long as there are people wanting to find velvet off-ramps from the Bible teaching and the Christian approach to manhood and womanhood. So yeah, if you want to be countercultural today, go back to the Bible. And you probably won't get back to the Bible via Beth Allison Barr's book, The Making of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood.